G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today we're covering how to sample images using Grasshopper in Rhino. So previously I've actually covered some image sampling techniques in Dynamo and Revit, and I will revisit these as well um, with a bit more knowledge that I have now. But today we're looking at the alternative method in Grasshopper, which is much more effective in my experience. So I guess um, why sample images? I'll just quickly touch on some reasons why you might do this. Um, so just it's pretty obvious to most people, but an image basically represents a set of pixels, which is really like a 2D matrix of data. Each pixel contains um, such data as hue, saturation and brightness, and also red, green, blue channels and the alpha value in some cases. As well as this, images can represent data. So you can use maps, uh, for example, depth maps, or also heat maps or temperature maps. Um, so it's really valuable sometimes to be able to interpret an image and extrapolate particular data out of its pixels in order to make sense of this from a design perspective. And as well as this, we can obviously do things like surface transposition. So taking data and applying it to a surface, such as a facade. So you can see a lot of examples here, um, one of which we will, we will look at today, which is the protrusion of elements from a surface based on a depth map. I'll be using Rhino 5 today. I believe that Rhino 6 will work similarly. I hope to be in Rhino 6 soon. Um, I had a few people criticizing and commenting on the fact I'm using Rhino 5, so bear with me and I'll be in Rhino 6 as soon as possible. Today's sample, we're just going to use a depth map and the image of the Mona Lisa. So if you look up depth map Mona Lisa, you'll, you'll find this image on the right, and obviously the one on the left is in a lot of places. So we're going to use this to apply depth to an image and also process some of the data in a few different ways. So without further ado, we'll just jump into Rhino and Grasshopper. So I've just got a new Rhino file here, and I've just opened up Grasshopper by typing in Grasshopper in the command bar. Um, so let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is just build uh, an origin point. So I'm just going to go to construct point. And by default, this should come with XYZ as zero. And you can see we've got a point in Rhino now. I will expand the Rhino canvas soon. Um, what we need to do now is we're trying to set up a rectangular array. So there'll be a few things we need to establish this array. So we need the geometry, um, which in this case is our point. Uh, we need our cell and we need x, y count. So currently our geometry, you'll see, is interpreting a x, y count of three and six. And the cell is currently just a 10 by five rectangle. Let's actually create a rectangle that has controllable size. because essentially this is gonna be our pixel per se. So we're gonna create a rectangle and we're gonna feed this in as our cell. And obviously we need to control some of the aspects of this rectangle. So let's just make it a square because it's a pixel. And we'll just make a number slider and I'll go between zero, 15 and 100. So it'll be a value of 15 at the moment. And you'll see now this spaces out the grid that we're creating um, by the size of the pixel. So this lets you scale your rectangular array, essentially. I might just make Rhino a little bit bigger. And what we want to do now also is set up some sliders to control the X and the Y count. Um, we'll also set our plane as um, the X, Y, Z point. It's not necessary if you're working on a ground plane, but um, it might be a, a different application if you're working on an angle or a vector, for example. Um, so that's quite important. Okay, we're also going to set up some sliders for our aspect ratio of how we're going to interpret our image, which is going to be the size of our rectangular array. So we're just going to do between um, zero and I'll just set my default value to 50 up to 150. And I'll make two of these because we need our X and our Y count. So we're going to feed these in here. And this will essentially control the size of that rectangular array. So you see at the moment we have 50 by 50. I might just downsample myself a little bit. Let's say we'll go to 30 by 30. There we go. So now we've got a little a slightly smaller grid to work with. Um, so essentially now we have our geometry of our rectangular grid. So we can move on with this. Um, so I think the next thing that I'll do is I'll, I'll establish a bounding box of the entire rectangular array. Um, so I'm just going to get a bounding box node and I want to get the entire set of elements. So I'm just going to right click on and change per object to union box. And we're going to get the entire bounding box of this whole element, which essentially gives me a surface um, that I can extrapolate to. What we need to do now is do what's called reparametrize all of these points on the surface to a UV coordinate. So U and V is basically a uh, how far along the surface uh, a point is placed. And U and V values always need to be between zero and one. 
So we're going to be using a function called reparameterize. I'll show you how this works. So first we need to get a surface closest point. Um, I just realized I actually don't have my, my bifocals on. I'm just going to go turn these on and put them in the corner. So bifocals is a great little tool that turns on the names of nodes. Um, great for education. So sorry that I've just forgotten until then. What we're going to do now is we're going to take our surface as our bounding box. However, we're going to right click on it and activate reparameterize. So this will actually interpret the surface between the domain of zero and one. So what we'll do is take our overall bounding box in the orientation plane coordinates, just in case you're not working at the world orientation. And then our point in this case is our geometry. And what we should end up with is a whole list of UV coordinates as well as the points themselves, but they've been remapped to the domain of zero to one. So this will let us work with pixel ranges within an image. Okay, so what we need to do now is we're gonna take a, yeah, we're gonna take a rectangle as well, and we're gonna create a bunch of pixels. So we're gonna make some, some more rectangles to carry forward with later. So all of our rectangles we wanna place at our geometry, and we'll make our X and our Y size the size of our pixels. And we're gonna use these later. So each of our pixels now also has a rectangle that we can use later on. Um, and it's mapped in the same list order as the pixel values that we're gonna extract from our image. So we can use these later. What I'll do is just turn off the preview for these for now. I'll just also turn off the preview for a few other things. I'll turn off my bounding box, turn off my array, and I'll turn off my closest points. So my closest points essentially have been remapped at this point. So what we're gonna do now is use a really important node to this tutorial, which is the image sampler. So I'm just gonna click and drag one off the canvas from up here in input. And what you'll need to do is just double click on it, or you can right click and file path. Um, but I'm just gonna go file path, and I'm gonna first get, I'll first get just the image of the Mona Lisa. And you'll see you get a whole bunch of options for how you can work with this. Now you can remap your domain manually if you didn't wanna reparameterize your domain. Um, but I find that reparameterizing is so much more efficient because your image can change size and you don't have to set your domain manually, which is really important. Um, the way that you interpret your image can change as well. You can flip your image, you can tile it, you can clamp it. So there's a lot of options there. And you can also extrapolate different channels of your image. So I can just say only focus on the red channel, for example. And the value that will come out is the red pixel value. Green, blue, alpha, uh, I believe this is hue, saturation, and brightness. So I can just do brightness and there you go. Now I can see how black or white in, in interpretation of how dark or light the image is. But what I want in this case, first of all, is just my RGB values. So I'm just gonna be sampling my UV points. And what I should get is a list of values. Sorry, I need to get a panel instead. I should get a list of RGB values and there you go. So these are essentially my pixel values for my whole image and we get 900 uh, samples as we'd expect. So that's one thing I'm gonna sample. The other image I'd like to sample is my depth map. So I'm gonna use that to control a different aspect of my image. So I'm just gonna double click this and locate my depth map as well. In this case, I will just interpret the brightness of the image. And instead we'll get a different value as I output for this image in this case. So now you see we get a number between zero and one. So obviously zero being a darker value and one being a lighter value. So we can use this to control the depth of things such as the height of a, of a, um, a box, which is what we're gonna do in this case. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just take a very basic function and I'm just gonna color in the pixels of the grid to the color of the image. So I'll just create a custom preview node and I'll take my original points from back here as my geometry and I'll make them the color of my image. And there you go, you can see that we very roughly get a, a pixel version just as points. You can see the, the logic of how the points and the UVs are essentially in the same positions in relation to the image. So that's really important to understand because now you can really work with these in quite creative ways. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna remap the domain of our depth. So we're gonna basically take a remap numbers node and we're gonna remap our brightness to a, a base and a top number. So essentially we're gonna be controlling the height and the depth of a set of boxes. 
So we're going to give our image actual 3D depth, which is pretty cool. So we're going to go between 0 up to uh, 300, and we'll just start at a value of 150. So this is uh, the top of our range, and then we'll likewise have the bottom of our range as well. Sorry, cut. And what we're going to do is construct a domain out of these. Because we'll have a source domain and we'll have a target domain. So by default, our source domain should be 0 to 1. And you can see there it is. Um, and that's true and correct because our, our brightness node gives us a, a domain between 0 and 1. So we've already got our source uh, set up. What we need to do now is construct a new domain for our target. So I've just got a, a cat. <laughs> cat down here blocking my keyboard. Uh, construct domain. And we'll have a start and an end. So I'll start and I'll end. And this will be my target domain. Now if we go to our mapped uh, domain, or our mapped number list, you can see that it's remapped it to where it stands in the new domain range. So we can use this to control the height of boxes. Um, so what I'll do in this case is just take a box rectangle and I'm going to call back on these rectangles here. Call on these for my rectangle. And for my height, I'm going to call on this mapped list of heights. And now you can see we actually end up with a set of boxes. Note that currently my image is inverted, so my depth is the wrong direction. So the reason why you set these sliders up for a domain is you can essentially change the direction that the domain influences the image. So domains can work in a backwards or a forwards direction. So depending how you want to want to protrude or extrude your image, you can work with the domain to do this. You can also find another really quick technique to invert your image. So what I found is really handy and one that I haven't seen in any tutorials. It's just, just to set up a little expression. So I'm going to get a expression and I want two values here. So I want X and I want Y. And my expression, I will make this the absolute value. So ABS of Y take X. And essentially, um, we can use this to control whether we're looking at the top or the bottom by range. Sorry, my cat just keeps jumping up on my keyboard. Can't have that. Okay, so what we're going to do is feed in uh, numbers between 0 and 1 instead into our expression. And I'm going to create what's called a value list. And essentially a value list lets you pick a, a range of items that the user can nominate. So in this case, we're going to make the standard equal 0 and inverted equal 1. So now when the user picks standard or inverted, we can feed in y, and it will essentially flip our values per se, because we're working with an absolute value. So you'll see if I go from standard to inverted, notice that my numbers change from which side of one they're on. So this lets us invert our domain very quickly, because what I can do now is feed this in as my value instead. And you'll see I can invert, or I can go standard, and I can literally flip that relationship straight away without having to worry about mucking around with my domain. Um, so pretty cool, right? So now that we've got these boxes, essentially I can just turn the preview off for these. I'll just use my radial menu. And instead of feeding in our points, I'll feed in our boxes. There you go. And you'll see that now we've got a 3D extruded version of the Mona Lisa. Obviously I can increase my pixel count to add detail. You can see how we can abstract an image into a geometric form uh, using the image sampler. So pretty cool. Um, there's another common technique people often use in image sampling that I've noticed in tutorials, which is to take a bunch of circles and change their radius to set an aperture or an amount of light or space that's being let through the circle. So we can do a circle, uh, I think it's circle by, circle by plane and radius. Oh. I don't know if it's called CPR. No, it's not. I think it's just a standard circle node, yes. A circle by plane and radius. In this case, our plane is our point, or our geometry. What I might do is just disable this node. And you'll see already we've got a basic circle 
at the middle of each, uh, or at the center of each point. Uh, what we want to do now is we'll set up a radius from our mapped values. Obviously, you can see that our numbers aren't quite right here. So it's probably good for us to set up a division uh, node here. And we'll just feed our mapped value in here. And we'll just add a slider from 1. And we'll just go to 5 up to 15. So this lets us set the, the amount of downsizing of those circles. So as I increase this, you'll see that uh, my circles get more refined. And you'll see that depending on the value at certain points, so if it's closer, it's a bigger circle. If it's further away, it's a smaller one. You'll see that now we can interpret our image in a different way again, um, which is really cool. And obviously I can go again and feed my geometry into my color node and just disable my preview. And you'll see now I've also got color as an aspect of how I'm sampling the image. Um, so pretty cool, right? Um, and probably the last thing I'll show you, which I haven't seen too many tutorials cover, because I know there's a lot of tutorials on image sampling, so I've tried to bring together a lot of things that I've seen in separate sessions, is that we'll deconstruct our points. Because I, I basically want to remap my points to be at a height, um, so essentially the top of the box, um, but in the same x, y positions. So I'm going to take a deconstruct point. And I'll take my, my points, and I'll get the x, y, and z component. I'll go to construct point, and I'll take the x and the y component of my points. But for my z component, I'll take my remapped range. And you'll see now I've got a set of points at the same height that the boxes would be at in this case. I'm just going to disable my circle node. And what we can do with these is actually create a surface from points. So I'm going to get a surface from points. And I'll take these points. Uh, for my U count, I need to go back to the start of my script and take my sampling value. You'll see now I have a surface that follows these points as well. So now we have a single surface we can work with rather than a set of boxes. Um, what I can do with this is just turn off the preview. And I can divide the domain using a divide domain squared. And I'll divide the domain of my surface by my U count and my V count from the start. So my U count. Don't know where that slider came from. And I'll also take my V count. And what I can do with this is apply this to a node called isotrim which essentially divides a surface um, using a Cartesian grid mapped across the face of the surface. So my surface and my domain squared. And then if I turn off the preview of my points, you'll see essentially I've got a surface mapped at the UV values across the face of, of this overall surface built from the points. So if I turn off this preview um, from here, I believe, that these all get broken into individual cells and I can take my geometry and map color to them. And there you go. Now I've got a single surface um, that's waveformed but divided into cells um, that also respects the domain of what I've done. So a few ways that you can apply image values um, using a few different maps. And obviously this is a very literal example of image sampling. I'm taking an image and I'm turning the image into another 3D image, but you could apply this to a facade. There's a lot of ways you could do this. And keep in mind that obviously all your controls are still active. So I can invert my image and you can see that my, my image will invert in height as well. And I can change the depth using my domain as well. So quite powerful. Um, it, it's very flexible and it's very quick as you can see. So hopefully that helps give you some tools that you can play with. And hopefully in future videos, I'll cover some more practical applications for these tools. Um, but thanks for watching today. Hopefully that really helps give you some things to use in Grasshopper. I'm really enjoying uh, using the tool so far and look forward to sharing more with you. Um, in the future, I'll be looking at how to process images using Python as well, because this is a very quick way to interpret images into uh, CSV files, for example. And I'm going to be reading these CSV files into Dynamo, because the image processing nodes in Dynamo don't work very well at the moment. There's a few bugs with them. So I'm going to be showing you a tutorial where you can use Python to get around the images, uh, the image issues in Dynamo. 
So thanks for watching today. If you've got any feedback or comments, feel free to leave it down below. Hopefully I'll be using Rhino 6 soon, so if anyone's got any issues with that, um, just, uh, just so you're aware, I'll be there soon, hopefully. Um, and if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so, and hopefully I'll see you in future videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.